You know that in our main service on Sunday mornings, we are making our way through the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation never gives details or descriptions nor timing for the rapture. Uh, The rapture is a doctrine that comes from our Bible, and it is related to the events of the book of Revelation. And yet, much to my own disappointment, and this is a misguided disappointment, uh, God knows best how to write his word. (laughs) But I have at times thought, well, if the book of Revelation is giving us a chronological sequence of end times events, shouldn't there be a verse that says, here's where the rapture happens, boom. And the book of Revelation doesn't. And so as we have our hearts and our minds under the book of Revelation for uh, the months to come in Sunday morning exposition, uh, we're going to take this time during equipping hour and talk through the biblical doctrine of the rapture. And we'll do this over the course of three weeks, Lord willing. So this morning is installment number one, and I am working on a set of notes that will cover the entirety of the three sessions. So if you got on the web looking for notes for this morning's session, they're not there because they're not finished. Uh, Unlike God's plan, which is finished in his own mind, uh, my notes describing those plans are not yet complete. And so they will be done by the third week. So everything I talk about will find its way into resources and notes that you can have. Uh, I have up on the screen for you a roadmap for where we will be going over the next three weeks. Uh, First, we're going to cover some initial considerations. Uh, That is the bulk of what we'll talk about this morning. We'll ask the question, what is the rapture? And the question, when is the rapture? And then we'll look at the primary texts detailing the rapture. Uh, Then we'll look at secondary texts, uh, less explicit texts that deal with some of the corollary features of the rapture of the church. And then we'll talk about some indications. And what I mean by that is indications from the rest of Scripture that the timing of the rapture detailed for us in our primary texts is consistent. And and why that is important is if there is a view related to end times that a theologian selects and it does not fit with all of Scripture, then it's the wrong view. Do you understand, we, this, this is a bibliological question. God is not double-minded. The Bible never contradicts itself. There will never be one passage of Scripture that is an enemy of another passage of Scripture. We believe in the single A, capital A author of the Bible is God himself. And, and he intended to be clear in his communication. He intended to be accurate in his communication. And he does not fail in those things. And so the the work depends on us to make sure we understand various passages of Scripture correctly. But no single passage of Scripture can be overrun by a system or by a favorite theology or by a favorite view. Every passage of Scripture, rightly understood, must be able to stand. And so we have to look at the breadth and depth of God's Word, and we will look at other indications related to the doctrine of the rapture, to see if uh, our New Testament depiction of the rapture stands up to the rest of Scripture. Uh, Then we'll look at what I call consistencies, which are doctrines and timings uh, that relate to the rapture and to see if they hold together. And then we we have just this catch-all, other considerations. What does that mean? You have to wait to find out. Um, Some of that has to do with considering other rapture views, and some of the pros and cons related to those. Finally, we'll look at objections. Uh, When when people hear talk of the rapture, there are some common objections that people give, and we'll work through those sort of one by one. And then you will have some resources that I'll make available to you that you can use for further study. So that's our roadmap for the next three weeks. Uh, This morning, we're going to start with some initial considerations. And first on the list is just to acknowledge the difficulty of working through the doctrine of the rapture of the church. This is not an easy doctrine to discover, to articulate, to work out with other doctrines in the Bible. Uh, It it relates to many passages, 
Uh, it, there is no single passage in Scripture which tells, that tells us what the rapture is and when it will take place in relationship to all other end times events. That means you have to not just have one proof text for the rapture, but look at the various passages that speak of it directly and consider all of the other passages that speak of it indirectly or agree with it in some form or fashion. You have to understand what the great tribulation is for. You have to have some understanding of what the day of the Lord is and what it isn't. You have to understand the relationship of Israel and the church. You have to understand Daniel's 70th week. You need to understand the chronological framework of the book of Revelation. You have to do lexical work. What do words mean? You have to do syntactical work. How do these passages fit in their contexts? In other words, there is a lot to get after. And what it means is we shouldn't have the view about the doctrine of the rapture that, oh, this is so easy, this is so clear, I can't believe people don't understand it. How could they not? It's just not as simple as some other doctrines. That just means we have to have much patience with one another. We sometimes have to do the first-hand work of diving into passages ourselves where we have questions and we have doubts. It lacks some level of honesty to sort of skip across the pond, as it were, not dive deeply, and then think we've got it all together, and then criticize those who are asking good questions we probably should have dug into. So all of that means we just need to be patient with each other. The doctrine of the rapture is not one of those doctrines which, if not believed, keeps you out of heaven. Do you understand? It doesn't fall into the category of heresy to disbelieve the rapture or to believe something wrong about the rapture. I would contend to you that the thief on the cross probably didn't know about a rapture and was promised paradise on the spot by simple faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we just need to be careful about how we hold this. Acknowledging the difficulty of this doctrine is a really good starting place for us all. A second initial consideration is we must pay attention to the details. I love the way scripture is written. This, of course, is God's word. It comes out of his infinite mind, and he has condescended to communicate to us in ways we can understand. And he does so in the macro and the micro. There is a big picture we must understand of scripture. And that big picture is made up of the details. If, if, we, are gravi if we gravitate, and you need to know this about yourself, if you gravitate to the big picture... And you think, well, I just need the big grand storyline of redemption. I, I, I just need Jesus loves me and God's glory and maybe five solas of the Reformation and five points of Calvinism, and I'm good. <laughs> you have to understand these things are made from the details rightly derived from the scriptures. The big picture is made of the pixels. Now, you might be the kind of person that loses sight of the big picture and gets real granular. And, and you've been diagramming the same phrase out of one Bible verse as your daily devotions for the last year. <laughs> I would suggest you need to look up, get some oxygen, get to 30,000 feet, and look at the whole panorama a little more. And I want my cake, and I want to eat it. Do you know what I mean by that? I want the big picture and the granular. I want the forest and the trees. I want to see how does this forest sit on God's earth, the, the, the big picture from 30,000 feet. And I want to get down in it. And I want to examine a, a glade in that forest. A, and maybe one standing grove of trees. And, and, and then I want to look at an individual tree and, and a branch on that tree and the bark on that branch and the bark beetle under the bark on that branch and the wings on that bark beetle and the cellular makeup of those wings. I want all of it because the big picture is made of the details. And when it comes to studying a doctrine like the rapture, you need to know the details matter. Word study matters. Context matters matters. And sometimes we get impatient with detailed study because it takes work. And sometimes we can say, oh, that's just too complicated. It's too much for me to think about. And so it must not matter. I'm going to suggest to you that is not God's view. 
Throughout church history, we have seen that error, grievous error, has been caused by a missing of a simple detail. You may, you may remember the early Christological debates in church history and Athanasius hanging the, the right view of Christology on a single iota related to, is Christ actually God in his essential being? And the church divided on these things and the details matter. You may remember from your Reformation history and the Marian martyrs, those Protestant reformers in England who died under Bloody Mary and were burned at the stake over the technical details of how communion was done. Right? The doctrine of transubstantiation said that the, the leaders of the church turned the bread into the actual body of Christ and turned the wine into the actual blood of Christ. And if you didn't believe that, then you couldn't benefit from his being re-sacrificed week after week, mass after mass. And the evangelicals, the, the ones who love the gospel, said, no, that is an affront to the gospel. And, and we might have criticized them for being... So concerned about some theological minutia. You mean you're, gonna, you're willing to be dragged out into the courtyard by the government, away from your family, and in some cases away from your, your wife holding the, the infant, the ninth child in your family, parading you out in front of them as they've got tears in their eyes and they're waving goodbye to daddy. And you're willing to get burned at the stake over a technical detail over communion? Yes, because the gospel mattered in that. Just know that the details matter to God. He wrote them. We can't just hover over them or fly over them. There are times where we need to dig in. That is particularly true in this doctrine. We need to understand the judgments of God, the, the similarities and differences in the various judgments. We need to understand the place of the church. We need to understand the day of the Lord. We need to understand the great tribulation. We need to understand God's plan for Israel. All of these details matter. A third initial indication or um, consideration is that we need to recognize the importance of doctrine. And in this study, we need to recognize the importance of the doctrine of the rapture. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we'll get to this next week. This is one of our primary texts on the rapture. But notice how Paul begins this paragraph. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Paul says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. And just notice two things in this verse. It's not okay to be ignorant. Paul doesn't want you to be uninformed. And notice there is a so that in the verse. There is an implication for life. You see, eschatological doctrine, doctrines of the end times, theology related to the end, is never by God designed to be some academic exercise to just sort of stoke our curiosities, to, to know something other people don't know and to have some sort of secret. No, God tells us about the future because it matters for the present. It matters for the Christian life. And what is the matter in verse 13 related to the doctrine of the rapture? So that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. In other words, you're to be different in the world, different than the world, particularly as it relates to our hope of the resurrection, practically applied to believers who have already left their time on this earth. That was the crisis for the Thessalonian believers. There would be another eschatological crisis that Paul had to help them through in 2 Thessalonians. But look at verse 18. Of chapter 4. This is sort of the, the other bookend to this paragraph on the rapture. Paul says, therefore, and that therefore summarizes this paragraph and gives us a, an inference of what should we do? Comfort one another. Do you see that? Comfort one another. A number of years ago, for our small group in our home, I had listed out all the one another commands of the New Testament. And we began our life of small group together, just sort of looking at each one of those individually. Uh, we should pray for one another. Don't sue one another. Uh, 
confess your sins to one another, encourage one another. And then I listed comfort one another with this text in parentheses after it. Comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. And then I talked to our small group, and some of you are in this room, and I'm looking at you now, and I'm so sorry. I did it wrong, (laughs) Ken and Chris, and whoever else was there at the time. Comfort one another. And I taught a whole lesson on comfort. There's sorrow, there's grief, there's comfort. Thessalonian believers had lost friends, so comfort one another. Are you noticing now what I left out of the command? Look down at your Bible. What does it say? What is this command? Comfort one another with these words. Okay, so this three-week series is my repentance from that small group. Comfort one another with what words? This paragraph about a pre-tribulational rapture. There, I just let the cat out of the bag. (laughs) Comfort one another with whatever is described in these verses. Paul starts it with, I do not want you to be ignorant. And there's a so that. And then a therefore at the end, comfort one another. A clear command. Comfort one another with these words. This is something we should be doing with each other. Whatever is described in these verses, a command from the Apostle Paul that this be a matter of the content of our verbiage with each other in an ongoing, continual basis by way of command. So it is important. And then a fourth initial consideration is simply this. Maintain the ethic intended in eschatology. Maintain the ethic intended in eschatology. And and others have called the the Bible's discussion of future events as an ethical eschatology. And I think that's right. Every time something future is portrayed in the Bible, it comes with a so that or a therefore. Some implication for our lives. Some very practical application. And, And we could give lots of examples I'll just point one to you, and and this one perhaps summarizes many of the other ethical statements related to eschatology, but this comes from 1 John chapter 3. Verse 2, beloved, speaking of believers, we now are children of God. What a rich treasure that is, that we're looking back at something God has accomplished with present consequences into the Christian life. So past and present right there in the beginning of verse two. And it has not yet appeared what we will be. You already are a child of God and something else is coming. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So there's a future reality, a future reality coming of our perfect conformity to Christ. In this life now, we're his children, we belong to him, we're forgiven. If you are in Christ, you are a child of God, and you are undergoing the progressive work of conformity to Christ, little bit by little bit. But there is residual depravity, there is a battle in the heart and in the mind for Christ's likeness in you that will persist until you leave this life, but something is coming, when you see him, you'll be like him. Verse 3, and everyone who has this hope on him, that hope, it's the anticipation of what is to come, it's the anticipation of the future described in verse 2, and everyone who has this hope does what? purifies himself just as he is pure. Listen, thinking about the future is not a waste of time in the by and by. Some people have said, you're no earthly good because you're so heavenly minded. Well, that's a bunch of garbage. You will never be any earthly good until your mind is riveted on eternal things. In fact, God defines a Christian as those who long for his appearing. One of the consistencies we'll look at in the Bible is the doctrine of imminency. I'll just say at the front end, the the doctrine of the imminent return of Christ falls apart with some wrong views of end times. If you believe something has to happen in God's end times plan before you see Christ... You've missed the New Testament doctrine of imminency. We'll come back to that. 
But a Christian is defined as those who are waiting for him, longing for him, longing for his appearing. It's a fundamental definition of a Christian life. So this ethic here is if we fix our hope on him and fix our hope on what he has promised, that is to us still yet future, it has a purifying effect on the life. And you know this. What if Jesus came back while I was thinking this? While I was living with bitterness toward a brother or sister in Christ? While I was tangled up in some sin? While I was unforgiving? While I was angry? (laughs) What a shame. Christ could come back at any moment. It purifies the life. There is an ethic to eschatology. And if you are doing eschatology without that ethic, you're doing it wrong. This is God's design. So those are our initial considerations. Uh, Let's go to waypoint two on our roadmap here. What is the rapture? What is the rapture? Rapture is not in my Bible. Have you ever said that? Have you heard that? Maybe you've gone to an exhaustive concordance and looked up the word rapture and you get a goose egg. That word is not there. Have you had this experience? Where do we get this word rapture? Uh, The English word rapture comes from the Latin word raptura. It has a, a, a range of meanings. The word raptura is the Latin translation of a Greek word, harpazo. Uh, the, the verb harpazo means I snatch or I seize or I take away violently by force or I remove from something with no resistance. Uh, the word harpazo and its noun form, its adjective forms. Uh, you can have someone who does harpazoing. Uh, that's a harpax. Uh, That's a purse snatcher. That's a thief. Uh, This whole range of words has kind of just one flavor of meaning. To snatch away. And it's used a number of times in the New Testament for just those kinds of things. And it is used in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Maybe you're still looking at that text. I would encourage you to look down at verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. And you have this sentence, we who are alive and who remain, that is who are remaining on the earth whenever this happens, we will be harpazoed. If you want to make it Latin, you can say raptured. My English translation says caught up. And notice what verse 17 says, we who are alive and remain will be harpazoed together with them. Who's the them? Um, Back to verse 16, the dead in Christ who rise first. We will be caught up together with them, the dead in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord Jesus in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord Jesus. Comfort one another with these words. So you might say, well, rapture's not in my Bible. I'm okay with that argument, but harpazo is. Or if you're reading Latin, then it is in your Bible. So a number of people dismiss unnecessarily this idea of a rapture because perhaps the word is hard to find. Um, The catching up, being caught up, snatching away, Uh, Other ways to describe that, it is very clearly here in the text. We're going to summarize what the rapture is from our three primary texts this morning, although next week we'll dig into the details of these texts. But looking down at 1 Thessalonians 4.17, we have these realities. Believers who are alive on the earth at this time will be snatched away. They will be snatched away together with Christians who have already died. They will be snatched away into the air and they will be with the Lord. That is what the rapture is according to 1 Thessalonians 17. Our second key text is 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 details for us the resurrection. 
the resurrection of believers in the church age patterned after the glorious physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. And you know the argument from 1, Thessal- or 1 Corinthians 15. If Jesus has not risen from the dead, then his death was worthless and your sins are not forgiven. And you will meet God still wrapped up in your uncleanness, in your defilement, in your filthiness, in your sin. If Jesus isn't risen from the dead, we have no forgiveness and we have no hope. And so everything banks on the historical reality of the resurrection. But Paul doesn't stop there with Jesus' resurrection. He makes a comparison to the future resurrection for believers, the one that Jesus promised. He promised his disciples. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will never die. Or he who believes in me will live even though he dies. He says both of those things. Partly because eternal life begins when you're born again, and you go right through your physical demise, still possessing eternal life the whole time. And a future glorious resurrection, a reunification of physicality with immaterial you in a glorious, inseparable union for all time. That's coming. And by the way, nobody yet has their glorious resurrection body except Jesus Christ. What does Paul say about the present state of those who have died in Christ? Excuse me. To be absent from the body, he says, is to be present with the Lord. So all who have died in Christ, including the Apostle Paul, including all those whom we know and love who have died in Christ, are bodiless. And it's not like they're not having any fun. In fact, to be bodiless in Christ's presence is way better than to have a physicality and non-physicality unified here under sin. Sinless, wonderful presence in the glorious presence of God, yet without a body. They're still waiting. They're waiting for this event, 1 Corinthians 15 and the resurrection. And then you get the description of the resurrection. Look at verse 38. God gives a body... Just as he wishes. To each of the seeds a body of its own. And he compares a human death to a seed being sown in the ground. And that seed growing into a plant that comes from that seed. Uh, Each seed is unique. Pumpkins don't grow from watermelon seed. The watermelon seed doesn't look like a watermelon. Something much more glorious than a watermelon seed comes out of the ground. That's the parallel. Paul says, all flesh is not the same flesh. There is one flesh of men, another of beasts, another of birds, another of fish. Verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The glory of the heavenly is one, the glory of the earthly is another. One glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of the stars. Star differs from star in glory. So also the resurrection of the dead. Various shapes and shades of glory for resurrection bodies. But look at verse 42. It is sown perishable, raised imperishable. Sown in dishonor. Think about the the last moments of your physicality on this earth. Perishable, dishonorable, weak. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown natural, it is raised supernatural. Supernatural. English Bibles here have spiritual. That can give us the idea of some sort of ethereal, bodiless existence. That's not the idea. It's a spiritual body. That is, in contrast to our natural bodies here, an eternal, glorious, powerful, imperishable, supernatural body. That's the resurrection. Look at verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. What does that word sleep mean? From this same book, a few chapters earlier, Paul described Corinthian believers who were abusing the Lord's table and had been disciplined by the Lord, loved by him, but disciplined by him, and taken home. They died. Sleep here is a euphemism for physical death of a believer. Never used of the physical death of an unbeliever, but often used of the physical death of a believer. Um, Why sleep? Are you unconscious in some sort of soul sleep? No, it's just from this perspective, a horizontal body looks like it's sleeping or it's dead. That's the parallel. 
from our perspective, sleeping. It's a reminder, still very much alive, absent from the body, present with the Lord, very conscious. That's what he means by sleep here. Not all of us will experience that. Paul says, those who die in Christ get a glorious resurrection. But those who aren't sleeping, those who are in Christ, but alive here, experience something different. Listen to this. In a moment, verse 52, oh, I skipped over, we will all be changed. So the dead in Christ will be changed, and those who are not sleeping will also be changed. Look how it happens in verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Did you notice Paul including himself in that we? Why? Because he was still alive when he wrote it. In other words, Paul had the anticipation of the imminency of this event. It could happen at any time. There are not eschatological events that have to happen first. This could happen at any moment. Paul including himself in this eager anticipation. This imperishable, verse 53, must put on the imperishable. The mortal must put on immortality. What do we learn from 1 Corinthians 15? That, that this is a resurrection for believers who died and a change for believers who are still alive. And then turn to our other primary text is John 14, 1 to 3. Jesus says there, and this is in the upper room during that last meal with his disciples before he's betrayed and crucified. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What do we learn from John 14? Jesus will come back for his disciples. He will come and get them so that they will be with him in the place he has prepared for them. Where is that place? In his father's house with many mansions. So what is the rapture? I like to call it the resurrection rapture event because it includes the resurrection from the dead of those who are asleep or those who are dead in Christ. And it includes the non-death immediate transformation of those who are alive and remain on the earth into perfection, the perfected glorious state of a resurrection body that will last forever. And it is a presence with Jesus. Resurrection transformation, presence of Jesus. That's the rapture. Our third waypoint this morning is the question, when is the rapture? When is the rapture? And this is where we get into various theological systems. This is where it can be sort of difficult to track because none of these texts that I just read you gives a sort of definitive, here's all the end times events and here's where the rapture fits. In fact, the timing of the rapture is a, a doctrine that must be inferred or deduced by putting all of the other scriptures together. Now, I believe there are hints, even in these primary texts and related texts about timing, that help us put these events together. But because it's not as explicit as maybe we might like, Lots of schemes have been come up with to try to define the timing. So we're going to go back to something we talked about at the beginning in our introduction to the book of Revelation in some broad system uh, end times schemes. And we'll start with the uh, graph. The first one up there is, represents amillennialism. And just to sort, I'm going to use some terms here. We're going to talk about millennialism and we're going to talk about tribulationism. 
And we have amillennial, premillennial, postmillennial. We won't talk about panmillennial. That's it'll all pan out in the end, right? But we'll, we'll talk about premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. And then we'll talk about pre-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib, rapture. Now, the rapture timing charts only have to do with premillennialism. Okay? Uh, post-trib, or post-mill, excuse me. Oh, post mill and ah mill don't have a rapture except whatever resurrection event happens at the very end. So you don't have an ah mill mid trib conversation, right? You have ah mill, post mill, pre mill, and then under pre mill, you have all the various views on the rapture. Are we tracking? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, let's just start with big picture chart. This is amillennialism. And uh, what we have now, the, the cross, everything, everything about Jesus is in red on this chart. So you have the cross of Christ. Look at this. This is going to be really helpful. I'm going to point at that one on the back, and you can't see that. So, okay. So Jesus dies on the cross, um, and then Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father making intercession for those. He is also omnipresent. He is with us to the end of the age. But his special presence in his... Uh, physical resurrection body is at the right hand of God. He is located in heaven. And then Jesus, according to amillennialism, will return at the end. There is one event at the end, and there are two ages. The two ages are now and then. Now is now, and the then is the eternal state. New heavens, new earth. Revelation 21 and 22. So amillennialism is a really simple chart with Jesus' resurrection going to heaven... And his return to the earth to end all things. All judgments happen at that time. All resurrections happen at that time. Every judgment throne is the same event. Every resurrection event is the same event. Okay? And, and in between there, we have the church age or the kingdom. The church age is the kingdom. Uh, millennialism makes it sound like we don't believe in a millennium. Uh, the, they would probably like to say, no, we, we do believe in one, just not a literal future thousand-year one that you guys talk about. Um, and, and the church is the kingdom. God is king. He reigns in my heart. We're doing spiritual stuff. This is the kingdom. Okay, that is, that is all millennialism. The church age and the kingdom are synonymous. Okay, so really simple chart. Jesus left. He's coming back. That's the end. Okay, the, the next chart portrays for us post-millennialism. And I've got two charts for postmillennialism. There's the postmillennial optimist and the postmillennial realist. And um, you who are the realists in my life, you know who you are. Um, so I could call you the pessimists, but we'll go with realists for your sake. Um, let's go to opti the optimist chart for a second. So in postmillennialism, the, the idea is you have the church age, and the church age is the kingdom again, like amillennialism, but in, in another sense, the church is sort of bringing in the kingdom of Christ. And it does so, and, and you may remember we talked about this in the introduction to Revelation, the church either brings in the kingdom of Christ by gospel proclamation and missions, by evangelism and people becoming believers, or by the instigation of God's law on the earth through government, through politics, through society, through education, through entertainment, through media, that we bring about sort of a, a Christ-honoring culture across the globe. Some would say we, inst we, we instill Mosaic law as the law of the earth. And when we do all of that, we bring about this golden age at the end of this era. And that golden age is the, the kingdom of Christ manifest on the earth. And then Jesus returns post-millennium. In other words, post-kingdom. Once we've got the kingdom up and going, Jesus returns. In other words, the earth is fit for the king's return. That's the idea of post-millennialism. So optimistic post-millennialism reads church history as this, not straight line, but kind of an up and down progress towards Christ reigning on the earth. And the optimistic view of post-millennialism, post-mill, was very popular 
in an era of increasing technology, the Industrial Revolution married to Darwinian theory. In other words, everything is on a progress from worse to better, from simple to complex in this where things are getting better and brighter and better and brighter and gooder all the time. And that sort of fell apart at World War I. And it had a theological reinstatement after the Great War, because that was the war to end all wars. And then we had World War II. And the 20th century was just a mess. And so the, this view sort of fell by the wayside. It is gaining new ground again, theologically. Uh, the the post-millennial realist, and I, I just drove that this is not a technical chart, like it maps out things. This is just my sort of approximation of the view here. But early church history, man, the gospel is spreading, and it's going to India and North Africa, even the British Isles by the 4th century. I mean, what's going to stop the gospel from going to every tongue and tribe and nation really soon? And the gospel is just going. And then you have the gospel sort of buried as the, the pagan Roman Empire becomes the holy Roman Empire. You have the mix of of Christianity and Roman paganism, you have the mix of following Christ and geopolitics, and then you get the medieval church, which is seeing itself as Christ's kingdom on the earth with its capital in Rome, with, with its uh, priesthood and its altars and, and all the things that the medieval Catholic church became. This was a downward slide from the fourth century, and maybe this low point here marks 1517. Maybe October 30th, 1517. Because on October 31st, 1517, you have Martin Luther, 95 Theses, nailed to the Wittenberg uh, church door. The Protestant Reformation is sparked. You've got the Gutenberg Press, which makes making copies of scriptures and making copies of, of gospel proclamation literature go wild. And then Reformation spreads over Europe and then all over the world. It has come here. And man, we're making progress again. But now, 21st century, I mean, what is going on with our world? We're it's just crazy. This world isn't looking more and more like Christ's kingdom. That does not deter the realistic post-millennial. The realistic post-millennial, and we've got some very uh, famous theologians in our own town right here in Tempe that have taken this view. They say, it doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. This will turn around because God is king and he's in control and Christians will get their act together and will establish Christ's kingdom on the earth. And then when we do that, we'll experience the golden age of Christ's reign on the earth before the eternal state. And then all the events, Jesus return to the earth, the resurrection events, all the throne events, just like amillennialism, all happen at one time. And then that ushers in the eternal state, new heavens and new earth. Okay, so that's post-millennial. So when you're talking about ah-mill and post-mill, you're not really talking about the rapture. In fact, ah-mill and post-mill theologians will often talk about the rapture instead of using the word rapture, because that sounds like us, and, and they don't want to do that. They'll use the word translation, that, that Christians will be translated. And, and maybe you've come across this word as you're reading theologically. That at the translation of Christians, at the translation of the church, at the translation of God's people, when Christ's return, we will all be changed. And, and what they mean by that is the, the dead in Christ will rise, and those who are alive and remain at that time will be changed. But there's not a snatching up to go somewhere. There, there's not a, a meeting the Lord in the air to, to, to go somewhere else off the earth. It, it's all just this one event that... Christ comes down and, and then that's it. The eternal state and all judgments. Okay, so that's amillennialism and postmillennialism that really don't talk about the rapture. Okay, the next chart, and everything we'll talk about now is under the banner of premillennialism. And if you look at the chart, you see the red arrow, Jesus coming down, followed by the millennial kingdom. Pre-mill means that Jesus comes back pre-millennial reign. Before the thousand year reign. And Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand years. Satan is locked up. Uh, and the saints reign on the earth with him. Prior to the eternal state. And it's not till the eternal state. That this hard line at the end. Where the heavens and the earth. Current heavens and the earth are destroyed. 
and where we see an end of sin and death and sorrow and the curse. So between here and then, we have a thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth. And there are still things like death, the curse, although greatly ameliorated. And, and we've talked a little bit about the kingdom. Uh, so in the, in the pre-trib rapture view, the church age goes from the resurrection of Christ, technically from Acts 2 and the birth of the church, until the rapture. And the rapture in the pre-trib rapture view happens before the trib. That's what we mean by pre-trib. The rapture occurs prior to the tribulation. And the tribulation is that seven-year period of time on the earth that Jesus says will be the worst time ever. This is Daniel's 70th week. Okay, we'll be talking about that more in detail in the coming weeks. Um, but the church is raptured out of the earth prior to the tribulation. That is the pre-trib view. And I have marked the return of Christ here not as a return to the earth. He does return for his people. But it's not until Revelation 19 that Jesus returns all the way to the earth. So this U-turn... Uh, I've, I've given that symbol because to me it sort of looks like a harpoon. Or it reminds me of a harpoon. I've never held one. I've never hunted whales. But in my mind, this sort of hook picture uh, reminds me of the Greek word harpazo. And reminds me that Jesus does return, but his return is to the air, to the clouds, as the texts say. And we meet him there. And we return with him. Okay, here's the blue line, that's Christians. We return with him to be with him where he is, John 14, 3. And we are in heaven with Christ. We're, we're never apart from him. We're with him. And there are some events that happen in the book of Revelation that, are, that happen during this time period. And then in Revelation 19, the saints return with Jesus who comes on a horse and we in white linen down to the earth at his return to the earth. So that is the pre-tribulational rapture view. Are we following? Okay. That's the one we subscribe to. That's the one that is taught in this church. That's what the elders believe. Okay. Uh, next chart. This is the mid-trib rapture. Okay. And you can see the same idea. The, the harpoon, the harpazo. But this happens not before the tribulation. But in the middle of the tribulation. And you remember the midpoint of the tribulation, the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week is that period where the, the Antichrist, the world leader, the leader of the world religion, actually sets himself up in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and says, I am God, everybody worship me, and if you don't, you're all in trouble. This is where one world religion is all headed to, to Antichrist's declaration of himself being God. And the mid-trib rapture view believes the church is raptured at that point. And they would say that because they, they say the wrath of God doesn't really start till the second half. There are some other reasons that they believe that. But they would also detail the first half of the tribulation as the wrath of man and the wrath of Satan. And the second half of the tribulation as the wrath of God. That is the mid-trib rapture view. Okay, next chart. This one's fun. This... <laughs> This is the pre-wrath rapture view. Uh, there are two kind of prominent authors, theologians who have written about this. We won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, it's fairly complicated, challenging to understand. But the basic idea is the rapture happens three quarters of the way through the tribulation. So the church age includes the first three and a half years, the declaration of the Antichrist at the midpoint, and then some more time there. They, they put the rapture in between seal number six and seal number seven uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, but the church endures most of the tribulation. And then they call all of this here the return of Christ. It lasts about a year and a half. And, the, and for them, the return of Christ includes the rapture of the church and Christ's return to the earth via his judgments on the earth from heaven. And then his return to the earth also includes his physical arrival on terra firma. Uh, so that's the pre-wrath view. And then finally, the post-trib view. Just like it sounds, the rapture happens after the tribulation. Here's the church age. By the way, there's always a question mark here. We don't know how long it will be until the rapture happens. Anybody who sets dates is sinning. <laughs> okay, don't do that. So that's why these question marks are in there. And then the tribulation, seven-year period of time, and the church is raptured at the end of the tribulation. Uh, 
And notice the church doesn't go to heaven to be with Jesus where he is there. Why? Because at the end of the tribulation, Jesus comes down to earth. This red arrow comes all the way down to the earth. That's Revelation 19. The church is raptured, and the U-turn doesn't belong to Jesus. It belongs to Christians. And the idea here is that Christians were actually designed by God to go through the tribulation. The church does not get rescued out from before the tribulation, but endures it. So a post-tribulational rapture. Okay, do the, do the systems make sense? Are we tracking? Okay, uh, you can go to a blank slide or the last slide, whatever's next, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do with seven minutes is give you the opportunity to ask what questions are on your mind um, because I would love to cover what's troubling for you. If there's a passage that comes to mind or a, a doctrine that intersects with these things, you want to know how it fits together, I want to make sure I don't miss those things in the next couple of weeks. So if you stand up and speak loudly, ask a question, or you can raise your hand, whatever, um, I'm going to write them down. If there's a short answer, I'll give you a short answer. Otherwise, I'll save it for the next two weeks. Is that fair? Steve? No, Steve, you, you don't, you're a lawyer. You don't get to ask any questions. <laughs> Yep, great question. Steve asked, um, at, the, at the last trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise and those who remain will be changed. Um, is the last trumpet the same as the last of the seven trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation? And therefore, does that mean the rapture happens at trumpet judgment seven? Okay, I'll give you a short answer now, longer answer later, because we will cover that. Um, to, to equate John's use of the word trumpet with Paul's use of the word trumpet is unwarranted. The last tr second argument to that is the, the phrase last trumpet is a specific um, phrase related to a call to attention. Um, something like, <clears throat> you're going to miss dinner uh, if you don't get here by the last bell. Does that mean the last bell ever rung in all of cosmic history? No, but the, the last bell means what it means. The, the last bell when you're at school is the one you get a... You know, drop all your books and run out the door. Um, so there's a, there's a technical meaning to last trumpet that's involved there. And then thirdly, um, there are trumpets in God's eschatology in every view that go way past the charts we just looked at. So um, the, the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15 is certainly not the last trumpet for all of history. So that's a short answer. We'll come back to that one. Great question, Steve. What else? Yes, Carol. Great question, Carol. I did leave off one chart, uh, and that is the partial rapture view. If you've ever encountered a partial rapture view, it would be the view that at the timing of the rapture, the, the faithful church leaves or, or people who aren't sinning at that moment. Um, and then if you get your act together as a Christian a little bit later, you get raptured as that happens. Um, I don't think that view is worth discussing. They, they confuse um, passages related to the cost of discipleship with the rapture. So, um, so yes, Carol, at the rapture, everyone who is born again and alive at that time will be gone. That means the very next moment, there are zero believers on the earth. And when you read Revelation 4 through 18, you come across lots of believers. And, and we'll talk about this in detail. Short answer here is they're never called the church. They are called lots of other things, saints, beloved, the elect, lots of labels for them. They're never directed as the church. Uh, you don't see church organizations, church polity, directions for leadership, instructions for corporate worship, or any of those kinds of things. Why? Because tribulation saints, we can call them, are on the run. They're being persecuted. Jesus gives them specific instructions in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25, the parallel passages in Mark and Luke. Um, 
In other words, there will be believers during that time. How do they come to faith? Is that a fair representation of your question, Carol? How do, how do people become believers if there are no believers to tell them? Uh, there will be Bibles. Uh, according to Revelation 7, God will set apart 144,000 male Jews specifically marked out and protected to proclaim Christ. There will be various means by which people come to faith. Uh, the, the tribulation, and this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, is for the purpose of bringing Israel to repentance. But given that purpose, there will also be Gentile conversions. In fact, in Revelation 12, you have this statement that the rest of her children who obey the teachings of Jesus are on the run from the Antichrist. What does that mean? Jews get saved during this time. They become evangelists in the world. And Gentiles get saved during this time as well. Uh, so they get saved by gospel proclamation, ostensibly by Bibles, because Jesus gave written instructions that apply to that era and exactly what they should be doing. Remember, Jesus said, whenever you see the abomination of desolation, didn't you read Daniel? Jesus let the reader understand. He's referring to Daniel. You should read Daniel. And when you see that happen, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So very clearly, God's written word will have a part to play in the instruction for believers during that time. Um, and then we also have things like an angel flying in mid-heaven, preaching an eternal gospel. We have the statement over and over again that the, the gospel is, is preached and proclaimed to people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, simultaneous to the terrible statements that every tongue and tribe and nation and people are beholden to the Antichrist. So you have this global thing going on, not only gospel proclamation, but also uh, satanic devastation. Uh, all at the same time. So there will be believers. There will be believing survivors who populate the millennial kingdom in their mortality. That's for a future um, conversation in the next. I think we'll get that get to that in week three. What other questions are on your mind? Yes. Great question. We'll get to that in our study of the book of Revelation. But the answer to that is the Antichrist is a man. Human, satanically empowered. Luke. Yeah, I love that pastor. <laughs> I've heard him speak about this very thing. Um, <clears throat> read a lot of his books. Um, and his, his argument is the argument against escapism. Right? Some people gravitate to the doctrine of a pre-tribulational rapture because they want to get out of suffering. Um, listen, the Christian life is a life of suffering. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. Jesus said, in this life you have persecutions, you have trouble, you have tribulations. That is different than the tribulation. Jesus called, marks out that period of time different than every period that has happened in human history. There will never be a time like it afterwards. It is unique. It has unique purposes. To say that Christians will not be around during the great tribulation is not to say that Christians will not experience tribulations. If you're living your life at the altar of the idolatry of comfort and peace at all costs, you're not living the Christian life. And so that author is right in helping us not try to escape persecution, uh, not try to escape suffering, not, not try to worship the idol of comfort. But the answer to that is not make my system um, go against what God's word says about the timing of the rapture. Is that fair? Yeah, great question. Uh, one more I can add to the list. Go ahead. What happens to babies? Great question. Did you notice I wrote that down? And then I closed in prayer. <laughs> Dear Lord, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the time to look at your word. Uh, we pray that it would have the effect that you intend for it in our hearts and in our lives. God, would you grant that we would be eager to see the transformation that comes by sanctification, that we would be made pure progressively, even because we thought about that coming purity, the glorification that will happen at our immediate transformation to Christ-likeness. And Lord, we would just pray, come quickly. Amen.